Oh, maybe I won't. Hang on, let me just check my leads. Okay. All right, um, as I'm sure you can all read, I'm Andrew Lewis. I'm the Digital Content Delivery Manager at the Victoria and Albert Museum. And uh, this session is about... Oh, you'll get quite a lot of those, probably. Um, responsive web services and how to plan for them. So let's, let's get going. How many of you have actually got some form of responsive features at all on your website at the moment? Oh, right. Oh, not many, actually. That's, OK, that's good. That's, that's, well, good in one sense, at least. <laughs> right. Um, I'm trying to avoid bullet points in this presentation, which um, hopefully you'll be pleased about. So um, here are some uh, visual bullet points. So we'll be obviously talking about responsive web design, um, and most of you will be aware of the need to get responsive displays different between your desktops, your mobiles, and your tablets. Um, but I also really want to start thinking about what actually responsive means uh, in terms of users and what they really need. Um, so we will do a little bit about grids, although most of the uh, geeky technical stuff will be in the paper, which I have just tweeted around. So um, if, uh, if you want to have a look at that. And clearly, obviously, you can do all your, everything you like as long as you've got plenty of money. So there are some, some uh, considerations that we want to, to look at on there. Uh, but before we start typing, uh, if you want the paper, it's there. If you want the slides, they're there. And if you want to follow me and you can't remember anything else and you want to tweet me later, that's there. So I'll just leave that there for a few seconds while I have a drink. Mm -hmm. Right, OK. So generally speaking, let's make our site responsive because we've all got mobile phones. Everyone's got smartphones. And let's, let's just do it all. Um, obviously, that does assume that you've got some form of other website, a big one. You might have some tablet services. You might have all sorts of local navigations which are specific to you that won't, won't affect other people. Um, they all need to work differently on your mobiles. Uh, you might have more than one mobile offer. But actually, it's not really about mobile phone technology. It's really about user contexts. So what do we mean by that? The advent of everyone having a smartphone means you get things like this. So instead of having to stare awkwardly into other people's eyes or avoid eye contact on the train, <laughs> you can now stare into your screen and, and find useful things to, to do and games and stuff like that. Uh, or you can sit comfortably on your settee. Uh, it's more often than not going to be a tablet than a laptop. But this represents the half an hour where you've managed to bundle your kids off to bed. Um, after the screaming argument, you've got another half an hour before you've got to go and wash up. And in the meantime, you're indulging yourself with, with pleasure for half an hour. That actually sounds worse than it meant to come out. But, but, um, but, uh, I'm not quite sure what they're looking at there. but you know, so. um, And here's another experience that you may recognize from a recent presentation. So if you're providing services like papers or slides or anything else, um, this guy here is standing up in the back of a thing. Um, in the back of a very packed session, trying to do it with one hand like this. So if it isn't easy to use, he's going to struggle. And the classic museum selfies. For some reason, this rather keen young lady is in a, what looks like a toilet. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure what's off, off, um, off shot there. So coming back to it, it's about user context. Not technology, not gadgets, and not app platforms, but user context. So I will bang on about that for some, at some length, but just to... Um, get the message across. So here are some basics. Um, so this is the thing that everyone knows. You could ask yourself, but I'll just put this big definition. There are probably several definitions. And I'm not actually too bothered about what, what the, the perfect one is. But more or less, this is what we're talking about in this context, which is if you have people doing different things on different devices all over the place, just make it so that when they, when they do it, it changes for them. But the killer words there are, your audience chooses. And whether you like it or not, they will choose what they want to do. It's their technology they choose to buy. It's their places they choose to do it in. And if you don't adapt to that, then they will ignore you, basically. So here's the classic one. We've got a desktop site. We must make it fit down to a mobile site and a, possibly a tablet or a phablet site. But not really. Actually, that's just retrofitting responsive design to something that exists. That's not the same as working out whether it's actually really any good for anyone. Oops, I seem to have pressed my buttons there. So this is a slightly more advanced way of looking at it. Um, this is one particular user journey, if you like, which is how do you get to a, uh, a museum in this case. The reason I've chosen this one is, A, it's quite simple and we've done a bit of work on it, and B, uh, most people in the room will uh, be trying to get people to come to a location, so it's hopefully a bit relevant. So essentially, this bit over here represents um, 
trying to optimize your services for people who are not even on your site. They're all on, this is, I think it's Facebook and Twitter, which is where they generally tend to find out about stuff. So whatever you've got on those needs to, to, to basically optimize for their social di digital activity. Um, the discovery one is closer to the person on the sofa earlier. So if she's sitting on the sofa, or he, um, and they're going, mm, shall I go to the v &A, or shall I go to the Tate, or shall I go to the British Museum? And so if it isn't a, a nice, enjoyable experience, they'll end up going to the British Museum. So we obviously need to um, make that good. Now, at some point, you've got the hideous bit where you have actually got to go through the London Underground and wherever else you get to get to our museum in our case. And in that case, you just need everything really fast on your phone, really quickly. If ideally, it should work when it's offline because you'll go under a tunnel at some point. And then when you get here, you're at the awesome v &A. You might use your phone, but hopefully you'll just go, Ooh, look at the v and Isn't it wonderful? Um, and there's a gallery stream and so on. So essentially, what the responsiveness of, of your services is, it's got to be able to respond to these different people potentially using different devices in different parts of their journeys so that when they actually get there, well, they will actually get there if you get it right, I guess it's the um, thing. And you could extend that potentially to the, um, the visit afterwards and so on. So in order to do that, really, you have to optimize for the context that they choose, <coughs> choose to, to or either choose or need or are forced upon them. So uh, what is this? Any offers? A brick, OK. And what do you do with bricks? Chuck them with coppers. Yeah, chuck them with coppers. Good. Anyone else? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Danny Birchall, everyone. <laughs> Anyone else? Build hazards. Build hazards, yes. Yeah, sorry, I went, sorry, that's the classic answer. So thank you, thank you. I should, sorry, I forget. I should bring prizes for that answer. So, um, so in the um, Famous French painter's words, this isn't a brick. It's, if you think of it in other ways, you can say, actually, what, what is a brick? So it's heavy, it's rough, um, it's orangey, it's, um, I'm sure that is a word, it's porous, it's flat, it's hand size for throwing, um, it's stable on each side, it's a dense material, it's quite brittle, and it's cheap. So, a brick, if it's heavy, you could use it as a weight, or you could use it to displace water in your toilet system and, and save money, or if it's orangey, you can crush it down and make dye out of it. So. All these things are a bit facetious or whatever, but you should be thinking about the characteristics of these people's devices and the situations they're in, not the actual name of the brick. Otherwise, you will just try to focus yourself into it must fit on this screen. So if we transfer that onto a um, mobile phone, you need to sort of think, well, they can take pictures on it. It allows them to do remote speech, otherwise known as making a call. Um, it's got a rechargeable battery, um, which can run out. It's quite light, it's easily breakable, it's pocket sized, it's touch enabled, it's finger sized, so it's valuable and expensive, so you know, are people going to just use it anyway? It's got model specific features, so you need to be aware of that. And this one is more about behavior, but it quite often replaces pre-planning. You know, in the good old days when I was a youngster before they had computers, um, um, which actually isn't far from the truth, they, you, you had to go anywhere, you had to arrange it, you had to arrange your time, you had to work out where it was, you had to look it up on the map, you had to do all that before you even went anywhere. Whereas now you just go out the door, you take your phone and you do it all on the, on the go. So people don't plan things, they, they do it on the fly. So, oh, and it's taken everywhere. So why make things responsive, that is a question. Um, so here are some stats, these are from UK stats. So, well, it was released in August, but I think it was referring to early 2013, so that's, those are stats a year old. Given that we've had Christmas, the, um, the tablet ownership since then has probably tipped over the mark, but it's, it's basically at that time a year ago, 53% of adults were doing these sorts of things. Um, more than half of adults own a smartphone. And this is the even older Google one. So uh, these are referenced in the paper, by the way, in case you're wondering where they are. So not only do people have lots of devices, but they don't just use one or the other. They use all sorts of things. So the idea of sitting in front of the telly, texting the person on the sofa across the other room, I do that. And my son frequently texts me demands for his food while he's upstairs on his multiple headsets, gaming and Facebooking and, and stuff, usually in sort of quite colorful language, to which he gets more than he deserves back as well. So, um, and here we are. So here are some generally bandied about stats. You know, these are taken from a, something like a sample of about five or six thousand but you know you can't necessarily apply to everyone but generally that is the trend where things are going there's people doing things all over the place and they're doing it on their screens so planning so if we uh, know we've got to optimize lots of things we need to go into planning so let's have a look at that planning cycle here is a um the marvelous service development cycle or circle so obviously you need to understand 
audience needs, you need to decide the priorities, you need to adjust the services, and you just go round and round and round. So, so far, so cliche, but, um, but actually, really, you don't really know what's going to know because you don't... You can see what I did there. So, because um, you don't actually know what people are doing, you don't know what their devices are, what the next one will be, so... There we go. So what you need to do is you need to look at consumer trends, I would argue. So here is a... Um, this is a 78 record which was followed by the much better 12-inch record. Faust tapes, classic. Um, not sure that Carter the Unstoppable Sex Machines is a classic, but um, especially not Lonely This Christmas. But anyway, this is a 7-inch single. Um, no idea who that is, but it's just to make me look a bit trendy. It's some DJ. And Blur. Mm, OK, but this is a CD. So essentially what this is representing is the slight improvement in quality of sound and convenience of... Um, hard disks, which uh, took about 100 years from, from the early 20th century to the 21st century. And that's a, a long, continuous improvement that's got better and better and better. And then along came one of this, which is, I think, more or less this is the first commercially available um, MP3 player, which just totally changed everything. So this means that you need to have two brains, basically. Two brains. So one is your continuous enhancement brain, and the other one's your innovation from disruption brain. So in this case, some of your services, like your big desktop website, you don't stop making it better. You still need to make it better, but you are just doing this. Basically, you're just making something that exists with a known need just better and better and better. So you might do a new skin. You might sort of copy the BBC or copy somebody else or whatever it is that you're doing this, this web re redesign. But you also need to deal with that bit over there. So the most... Um, Obvious one is this is a continuing enhancement. So everyone had mobile phones. They've been around for a long time. Um, in the 90, 80s and 90s, the continual improvement, look, let's make them smaller because it's a pain in the bum carrying one of these great big bricks around. So it got better and better and better, except this bit didn't get better. This is a web. This is what the web looked like in 19... I think this is 1998. It might not be that long ago. So this isn't that long ago. But that was WAP is web application protocol, I think it is. Um, and that's how people access the web on those phones. So not great, really. Then, hey, disruptive technology comes along, and Apple actually makes a phone that people want to use. So this is WAP, going up and up and up, and then suddenly, all of a sudden, this thing comes from nowhere and says, actually, you know all those touch phones that everyone's been ignoring? Nobody designed them very well. But suddenly, somebody has designed one that people want to use, and all of a sudden, everyone's using it. And that's, that was a, it came out in 97, and by about. 2000 and something or other, it had taken over the market, um, which Nokia had owned for 15 or 20 years. So these things do happen. Um, so the disruption of uh, usable touch navigation, because it had existed for some time before them. So these user contexts, planning on the go. Phone is visual diary. So although you might make fun of selfies, they have got a very strong user purpose, which is to record what you did and, and remind yourself later and share it with your friends. So ignore it at your peril. Comfy sofa time, uncomfy conference time. Uh, and user context changes as digital does, which is essentially summing up why you need to keep hold of consumer technology. But we're all doing mobile thing at the moment, but voice is coming along quite fast, so it won't be that long before you start to think, you know, how do you be responsive towards voice control, which completely blows it out of the water, because all your fluid grids and things may not have any relevance at all if you're talking about speaking into a device, so watch out for that one. <laughs> so, um, obviously, rather than just get, end on that terrible doom and gloom note, let's, um, let's go for some useful approaches that may help you. Um, this is a fairly good one that you should be doing a lot of, so... I've made this big version, <laughs> just so that you can, um, you can see what I'm, but I think it's important. There is a lot of evidence out there. Uh, this is, um, that link there is a link to one of our posts where we've just basically gone off and found as many references to how people use mobile phones and stuff and shoved them all on one blog post. So um, these slides are up somewhere as well, so you, if you can scrub it down. And I've tried to make the URL as short as I could for you. But basically, just read things like that. There's a lot out there that will save you having to do it and on a much bigger scale that you're, you may not be able to afford. Obviously, communities, here we are. This is another slide that you may recognize from well, yesterday. So museums and the web, museum computer networks, another one. Um, in the UK, there's a museum computer group. All of those have got large pools of people that you can just fire questions at and they will help you. And uh, rock in the hat, Nancy. <laughs> so so uh, user data. 
obviously, um, you need to be able to measure success. I will get onto the technology bit in a minute. But this is a graph of how um, senior management wants you to present your um, success measures. So, random KPI, <laughs> largeness of KPI, get bigger forever, basically. And that, that um, as long as you can fit everything into that, you'll be, you'll be laughing, or at least funded. But actually, in reality, it's much more complicated than that. So you can do things like you can content for, um, do format segmentation. And this is where we've been looking at the difference between people downloading a PD map, PDF map and people looking at a map that we've made on a tablet that you can use with your fingers. So general, steady, not too much. You can see it's gone up. Um, it's just useful, the sort of things you need, pretty much need to be able to do to, to work out how to change your services. So if you're not doing this sort of thing in analytics, you should try to get, get more into it, basically. And then it gets more complicated, so device segmentation. Um, what this is showing is difference between desktop, tablet, and mobile. So typically, people go, how many people come to our website on the mobile? So it's like, about 15%, isn't it? And that's you know, quite high. But actually, if you look at different sections, different content has got a radically different um, breakdown. So the Explorer map we designed for a tablet, and um, Lo and behold, lots of people use it on a tablet, so, but that's just one tiny bit of the site. So the, the optimization in your responsive thinking needs to know that, forget all the other bits, when you're doing this bit, it's got to be for tablet first before you do anything else. Um, download the PDF, these are the people that download it on a mobile. Pretty much you don't need to worry too much about mobile optimization for, for phone users. It's one way you could read that because it's, at some point you're going to have to come up against money. And when you come up against money, you're going to have to work out which one of these are you going to do. Because um, you could make your whole site responsive, or you could target things that are making you money or getting people through the door and so on. So the reason that I'm showing you this is in order to make those sort of tricky decisions, you need to have some evidence to, to back yourself up with. Basically. You can also do this. So if you go into, this was one of those graphs. If you go into it, this is the same thing, but instead of a snapshot, this is how it's grown over time. So everyone's talking about um, responsive design for mobile phones. Mobile phones is the bottom one. Obviously, it's getting bigger, but the <coughs> tablet is getting bigger faster. So tablet growth is, is much faster than you may realize. So. But not necessarily across your whole site, but it, it's worth knowing where. This is a slightly more tricky one. This was one that we did with a survey with Culture24, which I think they have a session on, on that sort of stuff this afternoon, or their programs. But this was uh, a user survey that we conducted with lots of people in the UK where they essentially asked one question, and the question was, why are you coming to our website today? And there were five answers, which were, uh, if I can remember them, they were to browse, to find information for personal use, to find information for professional use, uh, for designers and so on, to make money, or to plan a visit. And this is, represents the uh, tracking of people using navigation across the site compared to the segment that said they were coming to the uh, museum. So two things there. One is we knew why they were coming, and that's a, a, a massive difference. If you've got stats across the whole site, they're just averages, and they can be quite meaningless averages, really. Um, if you know that you're only talking about one particular area of the site or one particular type of content, so these what these represent is people who've clicked a navigation that is taking you to information about visiting or clicking a navigation that's taking you to information about something that is on, as in why should I go sort of stuff. So pretty much, it's not actually that surprising, but this basically confirms that if you are planning a visit, you look at two things, how to get there and why should I get there. So if you're looking to visit us pages and you're making them responsive, when it scales down to the small amount of real estate you've got for visit us pages, get rid of everything else, basically, because these are the only two things they're really interested in. So it's not just about making your whole site scale down. Is this any of this making sense before I'm conscious that everyone's looking a bit at the moment? So, okay? Yeah, okay, a few nods. How did you segment, once you determined what they were coming to the site for, how did you segment into those particular businesses? Right, so we have tracking set up on the site. So. Uh, there's a bit of code which is explainable on the post. I think it might be referenced in the, in the notes, but essentially if you click any of the navigation anywhere on the site, we will record it and it will fire it as an event into Google Analytics. So this is something we've added. Um, we have it on the map as well. The, the session I was doing on Wednesday, was, you know, we can tell whether people have dragged, whether you've clicked, whether you've scrolled up and down on the menu, but not just that, but whether it's this side of the menu or that side. So what this is, is just going into the um, stats for the events that have been triggered by people clicking any navigation on the site and saying, of all the navigation that anyone did, forget the page views and, and, and things like that and time on site, it's like when people actively navigate, this, this is what they navigate to. And you can tell from the destination URL, basically, what they're, what they're going to. 
So there is there are notes about how to do that if you want to do it yourself on the code, <coughs> code and everything on the blog. So um, slide out the scope of this, but it, it's it, yeah, it's not necessarily something you can do. But you could do the same thing by just using the content. So if, if you did know why people came, you could you could do it by saying the content they landed on, which would give you an idea. So, um, so here we are. This is our um, this is our mobile optimized display on a medium sized phone, which is a Samsung S4. <coughs> and it is the two column view. So there are two views on this. There is a content view, sorry, two modes. There's a content view and then there is a navigation mode. The reason there are two modes is because on a normal site you've got all the room you like to put navigation. But on a mobile you're only really doing one of two things. You're either reading it or you're trying to find it. And, and the, the, well, the way we chose, I'm not sure that it's always the best way, but the way we chose is to say, give them everything, all the content when they're reading it, and give them all the navigation when they're trying to find it, but don't try to do both on one page because you've only got that much space. <coughs> so so that, that's how we tackled it. But if you have tracking on there, you can then start to say, actually, given that this is the navigation, who's actually clicking on what buttons? Now, you would expect this to go more or less like that because people do tend to click things from the top. Um, <coughs> but by doing that sort of um, look at, you can find that whatever, whatever the V&A channel is to people, it doesn't it looks like it doesn't mean anything so they don't bother clicking it because they don't know what it is. So this is the point where you start to work out whether you need to word it differently. And now in terms of responsive design, <coughs> something on a desktop may need to be worded different from something on a uh, mobile. So we have two separate, two separate man, uh, menus, basically. So the, the mobile menu is different to the, to the main menu so that we can change the wording specific to the display. Did you ever change the order? We have changed them, yeah. So essentially, about six months ago, we, we basically pushed all the ones that nobody's clicking down to the bottom, but don't tell Lenny. So you're not in the room, are you, Lenny? No, good, that's cool. Right. Um, they'll find out later. Yes, sorry. In terms of having different names for desktop versus mobile, what are the kind of patterns that you I'm not sure that we've probably done enough analysis to answer that, although we have got some. Uh, on the desktop only, when you look at, there's a header navigation and there's footer navigation and essentially what's in the header navigation is all the things that, uh, when there was a big bun fight about who's the most important in the museum, these, these are the, the things that went at the top like what's on and shop and all the, all the important stuff and everything else is down the bottom basically. But on the top it'll have a, there's a button that says visit us um, and that gets clicked a certain amount but it doesn't get clicked well it, the order goes something 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 and then the, the fourth most popular thing is is something like current exhibitions because it doesn't actually say that on the top there is a big banner that has an exhibition and so on but there isn't any wording at the top that says current exhibitions so if you're looking for current exhibitions you can't find it so on here you, you might want you know we might in the future actually just think why don't we just put it on there because it's something people are obviously looking for so it needs to be really moved in with actual uh, qualitative testing where you're, you're talking to people and just seeing what they really think but but it's useful useful to do so um, here is our map and the sort of thing you can do when we've got those things on is you can start to see where people use so on the map we optimized it for um, touch basically and surprise surprise nobody uses search which is exactly what we wanted because typing on a mobile device is a pain in the ass basically so um, the, the whole point is we don't want people to type we want people to either go up and down or to left and right or to switch and just use everything with their fingers so we've tried to make it um, as, as enjoyable as possible so that people don't have to search I mean it's still there if for some people want to but that was quite useful so um, that is the thing about how we designed our mobile website which is more about optimization than it is about responsive but it's like a second generation of um, so we made it responsive first, which was just whatever page was there, we just made it responsive so it didn't look rubbish on a, on a mobile phone. And this was the second way where we then retro-optimized it. So what we basically did is we got six pages that um, follow the classic um, visit us hierarchical sort of menu-driven thinking, which is, right, people are visiting, what's the subset of visiting? It's going to the cafe, going to the toilets, buying things, how to get here and whatever. So we ended up with these six pages. Each has got a pretty picture at the top, plus some text and so on. But when you use it on a phone, in order to get to any of those pages, you've got to click on a piddling little link that's only that big. So you're already starting to make people do something that is annoying. And if you're on a phone, you may be going in and out of signal, in which case some of the time it works, some of the time it doesn't work. So what we've done is we've just recombined all those six pages onto one page, got rid of five out of the six pieces of wallpaper, more or less. There might be a few more images 
got rid of probably about the same amount of content and we've just got one pretty long scrolling page because on a mobile you just scroll you just scroll up and down with your finger and it's easy so six clicks are gone and one scrolling is there sorry you were um, so is that pulling from the exact same content management or do you it's, have it, new it, fields that have abbreviated <coughs> and specific bits of content? it's edited down into one page but um, so one although sort of the closest thing to that is that each um, header for the section has got an anchor tag on it, so we didn't change the top menu on the desktop. Um, but if you click on any of those, it takes you actually down to it because the, the page is responsive. It is only one page; it's a scrolling page on desktop as, and as well as on mobile. So if you if you do it on the desktop one, you need to be able to jump down <coughs> to, to where those places are. But that, that's how we did it. We just put anchor tags in. So. But it's the same quantity it, of text. It's the same quantity. Yeah, it, 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 it's not a different site. It is a responsive site, so it, it changes. Sorry, I will get to it. It, it, um, it <coughs> changes its layout and it adds promotional modules and things because you've got space. But when it goes down to the mobile, it just dumps all those at the bottom. If people can be bothered with things. So. And the desktop is just one page. It's just one. It's the same. It is. It is truly responsive. It's the same page basically. It just it just removes and alters the, the display of features as it as it scales up and down. So I can show you that in a minute. I'm not sure what uh, how we're doing for time. Let me just check that. I've allowed a fair amount of time at the end, so oh yeah, we're halfway through, so that's fine. Um, so we can have a look at it if anyone wishes to, and you're welcome to speak to me afterwards. So, so, so just to recap, here we are, um, trying to avoid this, and uh, just so, uh, just in case it wasn't really reinforced, it's about this. So um, I did, so I'll get onto some basic technical stuff, um, but I just thought I would put it into normal language and put subtitles for the for the technically minded, just in case there are any in the room that ask difficult questions. Um, so one thing you do need to do when you're making the, the pages that will make it responsive is you need to start with simple web, web pages, basically. So before you've even made it, oh, sorry, tech people, progressive enhancement. That's, so, um, so I know who you are now. <laughs> so, um, so basically, whatever your page is, it needs to start as a basic HTML page that will just work. You, you know, it might not look pretty, but it will work. And then you can start adding CSS and JavaScript to make it do all the fancy things which you would need, need it to do to change shape when you change sizes. But if you don't do that, when you turn them all off or you get somebody who's got accessibility issues and they're needing to use different software, it will stop working. And you can't, you can't be sure what phone they're using. And so you might make it great for the majority of phones, but anyone else who's using any type of older um, smartphone, it will stop working, basically. So. Um, here is our website with the um, rather large, I'm not quite sure what he's doing with that tuber, but, and that's what it looks like when you turn off the um, style sheets. So essentially all those links are at the top, They're just, it's just an um, unordered list of links with A tags in it basically. And those things you can then start to target saying if you've got one of these things in the responsive, do this with it. And that's, so you, you do this with it on the desktop, do that with it on the mobile, and how it, how it does it is it um, changes as the screen size changes. So we don't use the server to sniff out devices. That's the sort of uh, older model where you have two sites, you have a main site, and you have a cut down site for people on the mobile because you, you know, they don't need as much information as the older one, when basically because people used to have trouble downloading. Um, what we have for your techie things is a fluid, <coughs> fluid grid responsive framework, basically. Um, and this is the killer line somewhere in it that, that will actually make that happen. Um, but all it's really saying is that when the, when the um, screen size changes, either because you've resized the window or because when it comes in on the device, it will tell how big that screen width is. <coughs> and then it will give you a different display um, doing it. And in this case, what this is basically saying is check the screen um, and the, the width is, I think this means if at the upper, anything up to 640 pixels, it might be less, more than, I can't remember. I would refer to my developer for the exact meaning of that, but ultimately, um, within that range, do this, and then your code goes here to tell you what to do to arrange the star on the page. But that's basically how it happens. I'm not going to go into great detail here because um, because of the vast number of people in the room, there's too much um, variance in knowledge, but some, some of the background in the HTML and, and the code is in the paper, basically. Are you going to say something? All right, okay, cool. <laughs> um, so we've got three sections so this is how it works if you go down to a small one you've got a banner and you've got these boxes if you go into a sort of medium sized phone so this is, <coughs> this is a normal size width phone an iPhone um, if you go up to a slightly bigger 
with the ones which are emerging. This is a uh, Galaxy S4, which I think is the, was the best-selling phone for a while. I'm not sure what that is. I think it's a Kindle Fire. Um, those are medium width, sort of fablety type things. Um, both of those, once you get in between two sizes, will, will spread it out a bit, so you've got two columns instead of one. Like, you'll notice it's the same boxes, so the banner is the same. The banner is um, proportional to the size of the screen, so as the screen gets bigger, the, the banner is just saying width equals whatever the size of the screen is. It's detecting it and rescaling it. As it does that, as it goes up to here, it says, do you know what, we've got a bit more room, so take that, move it over there, take that, move it over there, and that's what's going on here. It's all fancy and clever stuff. And then when you get up to this size, I haven't shown the desktop because actually the tablet's the same as the desktop because most um, tablets, even an iPad mini, will work at this scale. And then it says, hey, loads of room. You can sort of fill around, do all that, basically, and move them over there. And that's basically how it works. But obviously a lot cleverer underneath all the ones. Um, so these are different ways you can be responsive. So the, the classic one that most people will talk about is scaling position of images, which is what the previous slide was about grids. So um, one simple way is if go from a big um, visual, I'll choose what I want, chocolatey box type thing on a big screen to a scrollable chocolatey box. I'll go up and down with my finger and choose it type thing. Uh, but you've also got the dual modes that I talked about earlier. So you can't basically get all the navigation on the screen at the same time as the content and make it useful for both. So don't compromise either. Just have one or the other, depending on what you're actually doing for that moment. So if you're reading it, read it. And if you're trying to find it, try to find it, basically. So does the user go from display mode to say to Yeah, so, yeah, so essentially they, they do that, and it opens, and then they do it again, and it shuts. So, so the sections is the only menu, really. <coughs> it folds out. It doesn't replace the page that they've got. No, it, it pushes it down. So, so. But you could do either, so, you know. Um, and some. You have to watch things like phones have got their own, well, not just phones, but suppliers of phones like Samsung will have little wing menus that come out of the side. And so positioning of things, if you put things that come from the side, other things may come aside. So you have to have a little bit of a play around, but, but generally just try to fix it for the most. So um, you've also got responsive to orientation. Most people, um, there is some research somewhere that I couldn't find for this, but there is research that says that even though you can turn your phone around, most, very few people ever do that. They only ever do it in, in um, portrait, even though you can get sites that are designed for that. So it doesn't mean that you shouldn't make it work in landscape, but you should assume that most people will use it that way. So the, the optimization, that when it responds from there to go to there, the optimization over there is essentially, you should, you should look at it in um, portrait. So the main difference here, you'll notice, is that this menu here has gone completely because there isn't room to put it on the page. Or you could put it on the page, but then you, you scale everything down so small that the benefits of scaling a map would be irritating because it would be tiny. So you have a compromise. If you look at the stats, the search on, on this one is, is higher. So you, the search will go up to about 5% on the mobile because it's, it's much more prominent and there is no menu, which is a surprise, surprise. Um, but you can also get responsive to zoom scale. So you can do all sorts of things where... If you have it down on the mobile, you can give it an icon. If it goes out to mid-range, you can give it an icon on the word. If it goes out to big range, you can go icon word and full link. But if you go fully up, you can do all sorts of things. So in this case, this is our Explorer map, which launched about six months ago. So when you're looking at this, you can zip this around and do all sorts of things with it, and you'll see the bits. But as you zoom in, these room numbers, which are totally unintelligible at this level, you just, they just are removed when you go down to that sort of level, when you zoom out because otherwise you wouldn't be able to see anything. Or you would, you'd just be able to see loads of irritating dots that you can't understand. Um, so as you pull in, they start to appear and, they, and you can see them. And then the other one is you can go upwards. You don't have to res be responsive downwards, you can be responsive upwards. So the, the, um, the current plan we have for our next generation of search the collections is to make it, well, we'll probably start with a tablet because tablet is still more or less the thing people do enjoyable things on the web so they use Netflix they, they look at big pictures they um, well in the museum world I suppose the Rice Museum is the, probably the, the, still the best um, just make it lovely type of thing so, and that is designed because that's what tablets are, are used for, pick it up quick when you've got half an hour and do something nice on it basically um, which still sounds a bit iffy but anyway um, so in this case, the map has got scalable vector graphics as its main bit. These are SVGs for um, the subtitles for the techies there. Um, but basically, if you scale it right up to something as big as this, it, won't, it will still keep quality because it's, it's not got um, pixels, basically. 
Uh, of course, that's not quite as good as all that because when you click on these, these are coming out of the collection system and they're, and they're scalars, basically. But, but in theory, you can do that. Um, and one other thing that is beyond the scope of this to go into in any detail, but it is worth pointing out that, that there are a lot of things you could do, basically. Um, and in order to do them, you need to make decisions which will cost you money. Um, and the best way to save money is to stop, sorry, is to separate all the stuff that's in the back end, all the, the data and the content and the beautiful stuff and the collections or the events or the shop items, whatever they are, from the front end services. Because at the moment, you may, you may be trying to get it to go down to a, to a mobile screen and zip it with your finger, but if voice comes along and it really does take off, then you're going to have to change all that. You might get rid of all the navigation. It just may be a swipe, a really basic swipe, or it may just be voice activated. So there's a whole lot of things. Now, what you don't want is for all the content editing to be locked into the interface that made that happen, because if you do, you've got to re-engineer everything. So, uh, oh yes, yeah, sorry, I forgot my uh, techie subtitle. Um, so basically, here you are, one chair, um, which is one authoritative, I can almost pronounce it, digital asset. This is from our uh, internal collection management system, which publishes through the API once a month. Oh, sorry, does everyone know what an API is? Uh, just in case anyone's too shy to put their hand up, it's an application programming interface, which is uh, data coming out of the system that web services can say, if I tell you this, give me the results for that. It's a bit like what the front end of a search engine does to the index, basically. So here is a chair. Um, so when we launched Search Collections in 2009, it looked a bit like a search engine, and there is that chair. Um, a little while later, we thought, actually, do you know what? Some people have got mobile phones. Let's make it uh, work on a mobile phone. So we redeveloped it. And this interface is, is looking at the same data, but it's a totally different interface, let's see. Here's our main website. So we can, all our um, articles are categor categorized with, with a form of lightweight tagging. So this one will have furniture, and um, it's tagged as to the subject of the page. So this page is be a furniture page, obviously, because it says furniture. Um, these modules on the side say, well, go to the content API, find me any articles that are about furniture and put them in a list there, because um, the assumption is these people come to our website from Google, because 65, 75% did when we redesigned it. Um, they landed on a random page because they put furniture gallery into it or whatever they put in. This is the content we think they want, um, and this is the content that they may have meant, um, so we've done it, but there's no editorial um, resource needed to do that, it's just pulling in. Same thing happens with the images. So the images are pulled in saying, right, actually, do you know what? Try and tempt them with lovely things from the collections. And it's just finding furniture images and putting them in there. You can't see it, and I can't scroll down because this is a, um, a screenshot. But, but there are events that will say, if there are events that mention furniture, put them there, and the shop items as well. So we're still talking about the same data. So the same image is going there, there, and there in these three different services. These services are all designed differently. And it could be by your in-house team. It could be by. The ten, I don't know, developers that you can pay for from a random one-off grant that just drops from the sky one day. Um, and then we have digital labels in the galleries, and they use the same. So you can swipe and select labels that are um, to do with objects in front of you, and it's the same information in there. And what's oh, and, and the map as well. So when you're when you're zooming around, going Ooh, that's a museum, um, you can see what's in it. But it's all pulling the same thing in. So each one of these services, these five services have all been designed with a user context in mind. Um, so hardcore searching, um, maybe searching on, actually people like gallery staff will use this because they've got mobile phones, but not as used as much as that, but it's much lighter weight. People using the website, just try and give them extra stuff that you wouldn't give them because you wouldn't normally have editorial time to put all these things in. Digital labels, they're in front of these objects, they need to know what they are, that's the context. And then digital map, they're going, mm, shall I go to the VNA? Show them what's in the VNA, basically. So those contexts are all using one thing. This has never been touched by the curators in the back. And it's just whatever it, I mean, it can be, it can be updated, but there was no editorial need to change that information at all to generate all of these responsive versions, basically. So it's very efficient, powered by APIs. So you have options for change. Here's the big one. Um, money, obviously, is always a concern, but you have to balance the thought of you can not spend money, but people are using these devices, so the longer you go without spending money, the further out of touch you're getting with your audiences, basically. Um, now, if you don't have money, that's difficult, but in most organizations, you'll find there's quite a lot of money spent on things that aren't actually making 
nearly the same impact on people's lives. So there is a bit of internal decision making, but, but ultimately that is what we're talking about. If you don't spend money, you're not investing in your audiences, basically. Um, now clearly it's a bit easy coming from somebody like the V&A who's got plenty of it, but it's still, it's still important. So. Um, you can do things like if you're procuring anything, you can add it to the procurement guidance. It's always worth knowing your finance and procurement teams quite well because they, they can stop you. Well, they can help you stop people buy things that will cause you pain later, basically. Um, and you can also just look at the data. So this is a standard Google pie chart, which I've added some lovely little graphics to, so you can see what it means. But this is our visitor services. This was the um, thing I showed you earlier. So we did that because we could prove that it was needed, basically. And to wrap up, you need to think about your user contexts. Um, you need to have some strategic prioritization, which is based on understanding them. This one is about right here and now. If you're talking about mobile phones and tablets, this is how we do it. But this is just, this is the continuous enhancement bit. You still need to be thinking about the new ones that are coming along because they may overtake them. And then obviously you need some investment. And there we have it. So.